I'm Adam Kempadar from Film Spotting, and I'm very excited to be moderating the first spoiler alert Q&A for all of films. And I'm very excited to have John Sayles here with us, Lone Star from 1996. That was a movie for me as a college student uh, going to a small art house theater in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, that really did uh, kind of change my life. One of the pivotal movies for me that helped really make me passionate about cinema, and I'm pretty sure Thinking in Pictures was the first book I bought about the filmmaking process. So really an honor for me to talk here with John Sales. John, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We're going to start with some questions about your 1983 film, Baby It's You. We got great questions submitted to us about this film, about Eight Men Out, and others just about your career and about the industry in general. And we'll try to fit in as many of them as we can here. Let's start with a question from Classic Film Fanatic 66, who and or what was your inspiration for Baby It's You? Rosanna Arquette is one of my favorite actresses. What was it like to work with Rosanna in her first starring role? Yeah, this, this is a story that was brought to me by Amy Robinson. Uh, if you ever saw Mean Streets, Amy was an actress for a while. She's the, the girl who has the epileptic fit in Mean Streets. And then she became a producer. And she and Griffin Dunn uh, had a, a company together called Double Play. And a lot of the stuff in the movie is based on things that happened to Amy um, when she went to Trenton High School. And uh, she had gone to school about the same time I did. And I felt like, well, her experience was very close to mine. So she knew what was going on in the girls locker room and I knew what was going on in the boys locker room so we joined forces and I wrote the script and it took a little while to get it off the ground um, one of the the first um, female uh, movie executives Claire Townsend uh, was trying to get it made and I think Fox or Warner's I forget exactly where she was and they put it into turnaround and unusually for an executive at one of those places she started making phone calls trying to set it up somewhere else, and it finally got set up at, at Paramount. Um, we had quite a, a last-minute fight over the casting, um, but uh, Griffin had worked with um, Rosanna in a TV movie about the Warsaw Ghetto and recommended her, and I, I camera tested, actually. It's uh, the only time I've done uh, screen tests, um, partly because I was working with Michael Bauhaus, who was you know, shooting one of his first features in the United States, and I wanted to, you know, see how he worked and how his English was, and uh, partly to, to test these actresses. And Rosanna really just had the emotional range um, that I was looking for. Um, she, at the time, um, Toto had their hit Rosanna out, and so um, a lot of the crew would serenade her with that um, while we were working. And uh, she and Vincent Spano really did a great job together. Um, they kind of, before they had their big necking scene, they stayed away from each other and then um, really worked well to, to, with each other. And I remember, um, I usually don't do a lot of rehearsal, but one of the things I did with um, Rosanna and the, the girls who play her high school buddies is I had them get together two or three days before we shot just so that they'd spend some, you know, they're supposed to have grown up together and gone to high school together, just so they'd be familiar with each other. We didn't do lines. We just kind of drove around and they talked about, you know, their high school careers and movies and boys and stuff like that and tried to shock me, and uh, which didn't work. And uh, so one of the nice things about the movie is, is um, at least those friends really have a little kind of time together before they, you know, it, it often happens in movies where you arrive on the set and you meet the woman who's going to play your wife and five minutes later you're acting together. So um, it, it's also one of the few times that I, I didn't have the actors come to dailies uh, because some of our actors were actually younger than the parts they were playing and a lot of people were in their first or second movie and uh, what can happen with young actors is 
they see themselves in the dailies and the next day they come and they pitch their voice really low or they, you know, they're hiding their nose or whatever. They get very self-conscious. So um, I, I kind of, once people were done, I invited them to dailies, but not while they were still acting. Did that hold for other movies you've made since then? Is that customary for you to? Well, since then, the, the couple times that I've worked with kids, um, I, I've asked them not to come to dailies until they're done shooting. Um, but uh, with professional actors, some of them don't want to see themselves, and, and others really, you know, pay attention and 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 learn a lot. And and some like to go, and when their scenes come up, they go in the other room, and then they somebody tells them you're off the screen now, and they come back just to see the other people's work. There really is a ton of chemistry there with all the characters, the the group of friends, but also, of course, Vincent and Rosanna, as you mentioned. And this is a movie based on the title. And if you just read the plot description, you'd think, well, this is going to set up to be maybe a conventional romantic comedy. And I think in a lot of ways, it's very much an anti-romantic comedy. The thing that occurred to me is even more than their attraction to each other, the thing they most have in common is just desperately not wanting to turn out to be their parents. Was that yeah. something you were shooting for? Yeah, I think, you know, the you know, it's a it's a tough time in life anyway, that jump, you know, from high school to whatever comes next, whether it's working in a factory or going to college. Uh, and then there was the extra difficulty that it was 1966. And so, you know, what you see Rosanna's character, Jill go through is, you know, everything that was cool about her in high school when she gets to Sarah Lawrence is uncool. Mm -hmm. You know, her acting style, her coming from Trenton, all those things. And so she kind of has to, because she's an actress and can act in real life, she kind of tries on different personas while she's at college and starts to feel a little bit like a phony. And that dance between her and, and Sheik, the Vincent Spano character at the end, is really kind of her claiming her past in front of these Sarah Laura Lawrence girls and said, well, this is part of me and you either accept it or you don't, even though it's clear that she and she are not going to you know, stay together. I also, what, what interested me a lot about the project is that uh, American movies don't really like to talk about class. You know, we don't have the kind of sharp class divisions that they do in Britain where you can say two sentences and people say, oh, you went to this kind of school and from that neighborhood. Um, but we do have class. And uh, high school, public high school, is one of the last places where you're going to be in gym class with a guy who in two years might be collecting your garbage or he might be your boss. Um, and there's a kind of egalitarian, you know, democracy at work there that, you know, that's already starting to break apart, but, you know, it's still kind of, you're all under the same roof for a while. And one of the things that you may have in common is music. So music was a whole important deal. You know, it's the one movie that um, I didn't hire our usual composer, Mason Daring. Uh, we didn't have a composer. We just used, you know, pop songs from the era and then these four Bruce Springsteen songs. And a lot of the emotion of the characters comes out in those songs. That was actually going to be my next question for you. The soundtrack is amazing. How fun was it? And maybe how much of a challenge was it to pick those songs from all those iconic bits of music you can pull? How did you decide on the final pieces that you did? Well, certainly um, talking to Amy about what she listened to, there, there was a Philadelphia um, sound. Um, there was a famous DJ there, uh, um, Jerry Blavitt, the geeter with the heater. Um, and a lot of the stuff that he played ended up in the in the movie, stuff that I had listened to that had an emotional content for me. Um, and then the, the one time we break with it, it doesn't come out of jukeboxes, but it's on the it's on the score um, were the Springsteen songs, you know, and and Bruce's music is, is so, you know, it can be so high school and emotional in New Jersey that it seemed like the perfect music to 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 stick on to the movie. But a lot of it is 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 truly alchemy. Uh, you put the song next to the scene and um, it either works or it doesn't. Sometimes it's too interesting. Sometimes it drags on the scene. Sometimes it overpowers the scene. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where um, you see this showdown about to happen. Um, the vice principal who Sam McMurray plays and the Sheik are kind of walking toward each other in the cafeteria. And um, because there's no dialogue until they have their confrontation, I was playing Don't Mess With Bill. 
and intended to use it in the movie. And then when we stuck it in the movie, it was just too on the nose. Yeah. The, the, the characters are literally walking to the beat of it. But it's a good example of, of pulling a song out, but the architecture of the song and the rhythm of the song has already you know, affected the, the cutting. I think famously, uh, William Friedkin used a Santana song like Black Sabbath Woman or something like that, Black Magic Woman, for the, the big chase scene in, in the French Connection, and then put different music in. But, you know, the rhythm and the energy of that song is still there. Uh, the, the first, um, you know, opening of the movie, uh, we basically blasted, we had a bunch of, you know, speakers in the hallway um, playing Wooly Bully, and we got the kids to come out like it's the end of school, and we just said, okay, you know, the minute we turn the, the music off, Rosanna, you start talking. And so the kids had the energy of that song. I love that opening. It really does capture the, the hustle and bustle and the feel of, of high school there. Let's get to some questions about Eight Men Out. And this one comes from Teasel, who wants to know if classic baseball films such as Pride of the Yankees from 1942 or Angels in the Outfield from 1951 influenced you when it came to making a retro theme, a retro theme ball pick like Eight Men Out. Would you count any previous baseball flicks as filmic antecedents or inspirational material? Uh, you know, I've, I saw them all, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, baseball uh, fits with film very much be because it's a game of, of stopping. You know, it's not fluid. Uh, there's a lot of stopping. There's a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of, you know, the pitcher steps off the mound and thinks about it. Um, you know, before he throws his next pitch, the catcher can come up to, you know, there, there is that dramatic you know, um, kind of rhythm built right into the game where you can, you know, have this tense situation and you can actually take some time with it. Uh, if you watch the playoffs or the World Series where they have like 32 cameras or more on it, they've got a whole, you know, kind of routine that they do of who the cutaways are and who's scratching their nuts and who's in the stand doing the chop and who's worried because they just – you know, walk the runner into scoring position and now they're on the bench and they're hoping the reliever gets them out of trouble or, you know, the batter or whatever. Um, you know, so there is that, that kind of drama built into it. And I had watched all those other movies. Uh, one thing I was aware of is it really helps if the players or at least good athletes and can play. Um, and so we, we spent some time with each of our actors with a shopping list uh, very specific skills that they had to do um, so that, you know, they could, they could, you know, turn a passable double play. Um, sometimes actually in movies, the way they do it is they don't have a ball because if you're really whipping it around the infield, um, you, you don't see the ball. And so they're just, you know, making the sound of it and, you know, hot dogging or whatever. And, you know, when you put the, the sound of the ball on the bat and then smacking into the glove, you believe that there actually was a ball. We actually used the ball. Um, D.B. Sweeney actually hit a real triple left-handed on screen, which was pretty good because he's naturally a right-handed hitter. Um, so, yeah, the, those kind of baseball movies from, from before, um, including some very, very old ones or some, like, comedy ones with Joey Brown, uh, were all things that I watched, you know, before I made it. Um, but also I, I, you know, had a lot to cram into this. Um, there were actually nine, you know, it was a, for a couple of years, they decided the World Series would be nine games. Um, so even with the White Sox trying to lose, you know, the series went several games um, and there were some games leading up to that. So a, a lot of what I was thinking of was not just baseball films, but other conspiracy movies. Uh, one of the movies I watched a couple times was All the President's Men. And one of the things you realize about that is um, most conspiracies don't work because some of the people involved in them are ashamed of what they're doing and they don't have enough meetings. And so a lot of what happened with those ball players is they get on the field and they go, wait a minute, I thought we were just losing one game. We're losing the whole series? You didn't tell me that. Um, and of course it was just such a, a rat's nest of people with different agendas selling each other out that uh, keeping track of, of all of that 
while the games were going on was very interesting. I just saw some, um, they just uncovered some more um, uh, newsreel footage from that series. And what was interesting, it was up in Canada, Path A, you know, newsreel stuff. There's a couple shots in the Path A newsreel that look like they took them right out of our film. So I feel pretty good about the style of baseball that was being played in the film. Although when we did, we showed it um, for a benefit for some ex-major leaguers. There's a, a, a outfit called Bats, which um, tries to you know, help out players who were playing before there were, you know, big salaries and pension plans and stuff like that. And every one of the, the major league, former major league ball players said, well, I wish I could have hit against that pitching. Because, um, you know, although it was fairly fast, there wasn't a whole lot of movement on the ball. And it this kind of looks like major league batting practice pitching. David Stratham didn't really have the shine ball working, you're saying? No, actually, David came up with a curveball that you could see on camera, which is pretty good because he was never a pitcher. You know, he was a good athlete, you know, very good athlete. But um, he had a really good, you know, slow curveball. Um, and if he had been doctoring the ball, it would have been even funkier and, and harder to catch with that little pin cushion of a catcher's glove. Well, right along those lines, talking about actors as ball players, better off dead, maybe tipping their hand there with their moniker, being a John Cusack fan, wants to know which actor had the most athletic ability on the set of Eight Men Out. Um, I'd say in, in baseball terms, Charlie Sheen and D.B. Sweeney. Uh, you know, Charlie really, when he was in Major League, he was really throwing heat. Um, we had him out in center field, and uh, I think he threw three strikes to, to home on one of our shots where he had to try to throw somebody out at home. And I think the catcher dropped two of them because that glove was so small. Um, but he, he had a real arm. He had some, you know, rotator cuff problem or something with his batting. But, he, you know, he's a real real baseball player. And DB, I think, went to Tulane on a baseball scholarship. So just in terms of that game, those guys had the, the most. Uh, Michael Rooker is, a you know, um, kind of a superhero as far as being strong, but it never really paid that, played that much baseball. And so it was good that he was at first base and didn't have to do too many, you know, things other than catch and hit. He, he hit a couple balls that, you know, deformed the baseball. I mean, really, he could really smack it. Um, Bill Irwin uh, is an incredible athlete. Um, he's a clown and an acrobat and stuff like that. And so he performed very well. He hadn't played baseball for a bunch of years, but was really, really, you know, good at it. Uh, and David, as I said, you know, really did some great pitching, um, considering that he had never pitched before. Um, so we had a bunch of good, you know, good athletes. And Ken Berry, who used to play with the Angels and I think the White Sox and a couple other teams, uh, came in as our baseball trainer. And he had a list of, okay, I don't want the guys to get hurt. And if they have to slide, I want them to know how to slide. If they have to throw, you know, or make a pivot or bunt or whatever, um, let's run them through those things. So they have two or three days of training camp before we put them on screen. Well, that athleticism and the uh, just the authenticity of it really does come through in the final product. Dharma 65. Uh, you know, uh, Cusack, actually, we had offered him, I think, the um, – uh, shortstop role and he said you know I don't think I can turn a, a believable double play um, but you know if you were interested in me at third base I could play a guy whose nickname when he first came into the league was error a day weaver oh. and really got that um, that kind of scrappy third baseman thing of I may have to knock it down before I throw it to first base but I will do that uh, and his hitting was good. Uh, he also grew about two inches from when I offered him the part till he did it. And luckily, he didn't lose any of his, you know, athletic chops. Um, so he was fun to work with, you know, just on the ball field as well. Yeah. Dharma, Dharma 65 writes in, during the filming of Eight Men Out, was there a moment or scene in front of the camera or behind that stands out the most to you when you think of the film? Um, you know, there... there there are a bunch of them. The, the thing that stands out is every day at the end of the day, um, and, you know, we were shooting in, you know, uh, not quite summer, so the days were pretty long. Uh, we had to put the tarp out over the infield in case it got wet at night so that we could come in and start shooting earliest thing in the morning. And every night at wrap, 
the crew and very often some of the, the actors, players, um, and I would all grab onto the tarp and run it out to the edge of the outfield. Um, so we were basically the ground crew. And that's what I remember is everybody getting to, you know, run the tarp out and, you know, protect the field for the next day. Um, certainly the, um, the scene where all the guys are in the locker room and Charlie Comiskey kind of screws them again after they've won the pennant. Um, that sticks out because everybody kind of gets involved in it, you know, and it was one of those things. They're still in uniform, but it's, it's kind of a nice bunch of ensemble acting. And uh, we, had, we had a bunch of nice... Uh, flat champagne, right? Yeah, and, and we had a, a bunch of nice, um, you know, extras from the Cincinnati area who were all good ball players, you know, who, who played the other teams and were the rest of the players on the, on the Sox. And they totally got what was going on, you know, it was, it was, it was, you know, you're on a ball team and you just you thought you won something and then you got screwed by your manager. Um, you know, is, is you don't need a roadmap. Yeah. Rewatching it, what really stood out to me, I think maybe you don't get enough credit sometimes as a visual filmmaker, because everyone thinks of you as the great screenwriter that you are, but you look at the opening of Eight Men Out and how you juggled all of those different storylines and characters, really with the editing and the camera. And then the scene that I really love is the one in the Cincinnati hotel room where the coach tries to go, uh, Kid Gleason tries to go to Comiskey and he tries to go to the president of the league. And we get all of that, that kind of almost screwball comedy-esque Movie. Yeah, it's it's a Mark Springer scene, definitely, where everybody's popping in and out. It's actually um, described in in Elliot Azenoff's book Eight Men Out, and Elliot plays one of the commissioners um, who comes out and is kind of befuddled by what's going on here. But uh, you can imagine it was pretty hard to keep that secret. The Reds were staying in the same hotel sometimes. Um, there were sports writers all over the place who were, you know, either looking for a scoop or trying not to hear what they, they shouldn't hear. Um, and that was just that kind of comedy of errors of people trying to get their payoffs and do their business without getting caught when they're also not supposed to be caught breaking training because it's the World Series and you shouldn't be out drinking at night. And so you should basically be in your hotel room getting ready for the next day. I think it's, you know, you see Joe Jackson over my, my corner here. Um, the, one of the things that happened with these guys is once they got on the field, nobody wanted to look obviously bad. And Jackson was such a natural player that even though he was troubled the whole time and his heart wasn't in it, he hit like, you know, 350 and, you know, barely made an error. I think he maybe short-legged one fly ball and felt terrible about it. But he had a hard time playing bad even when he was trying to, to, to play bad. Yeah, a question here about Joe Jackson specifically from Lino11. Do your opinions or thoughts on Shoeless Joe or any other players line up in accordance with the movie? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. What troubles me the most about those guys is that they sold out their fellow players. You know, they didn't offer any, everybody into the deal. And there were guys out there who were, you know, busting their nuts trying to win. And that's definitely a sellout. Whatever their feelings, you know, in the labor situation with Comiskey, um, they were selling their play, the other players short and they were getting paid and the other players weren't. So it was definitely treason in that way. Uh, people ask a lot, you know, should Joe Jackson be, you know, in the, in the Hall of Fame, which is kind of a club and, you know, there, there are pros and cons about that. I always feel like, you know, I think they finally took the asterisk off of Roger Maris's home runs. Um, I think there should be an asterisk, which is the asshole you know, this guy was an asshole, asterisk, great player, but he was an asshole. And Pete Rose would probably get one of those. And Joe Jackson and Ty Cobb should probably have an asterisk next to him. And, you know, a bunch of guys who, you know, uh, as human beings fell a little short, but they were still great ball players. You know, is, what can you do? Uh, and then there's plenty of guys who just didn't get caught who are in the Hall of Fame, um, you know, who weren't that great either and, and may have thrown a game or two. Along those lines, in that film, which character do you find to have the most compelling story in real life? Is Joe it? I, I would say it's, it's between Joe Jackson and, and Buck Weaver. Um, 
you know, Buck was a guy who d- chose not to rat his friends out and, but said, look, I'm going to go out and try to win. I think you guys are doing the wrong thing. And then, you know, got kicked out of baseball, you know, nevertheless, Joe Jackson, as I said, he, he probably he played a better series than almost anybody on either team. Um, he kind of went along, along with it because he was afraid of the other guys and he didn't want them to think he was stupid, but he didn't, you know, kind of break his neck, you know, trying to, th- to throw the World Series. So, you know, and those guys really didn't have a whole lot else going for them. You know, that, that was their life. That was their reputation. Uh, another bad thing happened, which is that Dickie Kerr, who's the, um, the kind of rookie pitcher who wins two games, um, who Jace Alexander plays, uh, he got kicked out of baseball the next year by Judge Landis because in the summertime, he played on a couple barnstorming teams, which they often did in the offseason, off that included Eddie Seacott and a couple of the band ball players. And Landis, who, you know, had this kind of 007 license to kill because he was a lifetime appointee and a czar, um, said birds of a feather flock together and he kicked this kid out who had not only not been part of the conspiracy, but had won two of the games for them. Um, so it was, you know, it was a funny kind of thing where symbolically uh, they had to punish these guys. I mean, they were acquitted. I mean, they were, they were acquitted because of some, you know, skullduggery on the part of Ronald Wastein and other people of stealing confessions and stuff like that. But um, they were acquitted, but, you know, they, they made this commissioner and they said, okay, some heads have got to roll. You know, we've got to do something symbolic. And so these guys are going to get kicked out and that'll be a warning to the rest of the players. Amen Out isn't your only movie that's rooted in history. Red is Not Blue asks, do you feel that more recent films that cover historical subject matter are more accurate compared to the older ones or take more liberties with the factual information? Has there been any kind of shift that you've seen over time and how much attention is given to accuracy? You know, it really depends on the movie. Um, You know, I, I think each movie is a little world and it's up to that movie and the makers of that movie of are we going to use the period just for, you know, kind of a springboard? Um, so when we make we make the untouchables, do we have them wear our money suits because they look so much better than the suits that Elliot Ness and the wise guys actually did wear in the 30s? Or do we go and really try to make something that, you know, is to the letter accurate as far as, you know, what people wore and what the music was or, or whatever. So you can have our, you know, kind of rock and roll version of uh, Billy the Kid story or whatever, and it can be a good movie. It's just, you know, only accurate up to a certain point, And the rest is, well, we're making the movie in the 60s. So, you know, let's get Bob Dylan in here and, you know, and, you know, have it you know, be more appealing to young people of that day. Um, I think that, um, you know, as I said, it's, you know, it's really up to the filmmakers. You know, it's something that I personally get ideas from. And so when I do something historical, I actually try to really dig in and say, you know, what were people singing then? What were people eating then? What were they wearing then? You know, you know, and not be too revisionist about it because it gives me ideas. But I think, you know, other people get inspired by, you know, I, I've been, I just wrote a spaghetti Western from some people and it's not a Western, it's a spaghetti Western, you know, and there's certain things that come with that, like the soundtrack that aren't traditional Western kind of soundtrack, you know, and certainly not what anybody back in the old West was listening to. You mentioned that spaghetti Western now might be a good time to ask you about that project, Django, uh, Franco Nero, uh, potentially reprising his role there. What can you tell us about it? Well, the people are at Cannes right now trying to raise money for it. Um, the thing that attracted it, it you know, to me um, when I, I was asked to do a rewrite on it um, and then eventually to direct it um, was that it's Franco Nero playing his age. So he's this guy who survived the Civil War and a lot of other shootouts. Um, he's playing, you know, reprising the character, but he's a man in his early 70s. And we find him on the set of... D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, you know, working as a stable hand and extra. And that's the kind of springboard into the rest of the story, which eventually 
ties in with you know the, the the kind of Chinatown story of the water that was stolen from the Owens Valley and eventually irrigated the San Fernando Valley, and a lot of rich people got richer. Hmm. Let's get to some other uh, general questions off Eight Men Out a little bit. Noir Junkie wants to know how has Hollywood changed or not changed in its approach to filmmakers like you since you broke into the business. Well, I think, you know, Hollywood is always interested in new blood, but not necessarily to do what they do and what, you know, brought them to their attention. It's kind of, okay, you know, we've got X number of tent poles and is there a director that we can throw out the, you know, the next Batman or the next Iron Man or, you know, the next disaster movie or, you know, the next time we go to Jurassic Park or whatever. You know, that's, that's mostly what they do. They're certainly always on the lookout for uh, young comedy people. You know, so slacker comedies are a relatively cheap genre, and they, they're interested in people who are good at directing those. Um, so I don't think in some ways that it's changed that much. There's just a little less there there. You know, the studios aren't making as many movies. They're not as much of an institution a lot of movies get financed in other ways besides through the studios. Um, so I, I think that, you know, you still have people who are looking for new filmmakers. They still send people to Sundance. Um, but they're, they're really not making that many dramas. So if you've made a nice drama, um, it's, well, well, let's wait and see what they do next. Um, so I, I think it's actually not that easy a time to make that jump. Um, unless you're doing very generic, you know, kind of stuff. So if you're doing horror movies or, you know, another genre that's popular at the time, science fiction, if you do that well, um, and you don't have to spend a lot of money, you know, if you really have some good ideas and, you know, some, some facility with that, that genre, um, you can still, you know, get their attention. We got another fan question about those kind of tentpole movies and recognizing that you obviously want to maintain your artistic integrity, but everybody's got to eat. And they were curious, would you ever consider as a writer or a director trying to be attached to a major blockbuster like that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've written for some of those movies. Um, I was one of the writers on the last direct Jurassic Park movie. And then at the end of the day, when they made the movie, um, I felt like, what had been written after I came onto it and what had been written um, before I came onto it were, was more than 40% of the script. So I didn't ask for credit on it, but it was a lot of fun to work on while I was working on it. Hmm. Um, those, are, those are fun movies and they're hard to write well, um, partly because we've seen so many of them. Um, one of the problems is almost always with superhero movies, you end up with the bad guy and the good guy going to a really high place and having a fight. And then the girl gets dropped and the, you know, the superhero who's good has to say, Oh, I got to go save her and, you know, interrupt my fight with the bad guy. You know, it's, it's tough to come up with a new finale for those things. Um, there's a sameness, you know, to a lot of them. And so, you know, some of them, you know, end up just being a lot of, you know, fireworks and smashing and stuff like that without much of a plot. Um, so if you can write a good plot um, and every once in a while, you know, I think the Iron Man movies have been written very well. Um, you know, uh, if you can write a good plot that uses those things, um, you know, uh, more power to you. You know, I, I certainly would, would love to get those jobs because they're fun. B.D. Hatton wants to know about the transition from film to digital in theater projection primarily, but also a general shift towards digital image capture over film? Well, you know, there's still stuff that's very beautiful that you can capture on film that's going to look a little bit better than digital. Um, digital is getting better and better. Um, I've seen some very painterly movies shot in digital now, and the best cinematographers who get the best equipment and have a little time for lighting and... It, which includes, this is not the time of day we want to shoot that, um, you know, can do really beautiful stuff in digital. As far as projection is con concerned, uh, if you're watching a new movie, you might as well watch it with digital projection. Um, the directors of photography that I know really like digital in that um, 
it's it's what they signed off on. You know, it, they said this is the movie that I shot. This is the way I want it to look. Whereas in the old days, if you went into a theater in a smaller town or even a you know, you know, next to you know, um, first run house in a major city. Um, you know, the, the, the projectors might be unbalanced, so one, one projector was darker than the other. Um, they may have had to send the print to a, a print hospital, and, you know, reel number three might be bluer than the other reels. You know, there might be differences in focus. There might be scratches. That doesn't happen with digital. Mm -hmm. You know, it is what, what you signed off on when you, you know, you did your final picture timing. Um, so as far as viewing... If it's good digital projection with good sound, it's great. Um, as far as capture medium, um, th there's still, if you, if you want grain, um, if you want kind of a more film look, there's starting to be some things that you can do in digital that, you know, gets close to it. But there's still, you know, there's still things that film can do and look like that you're not going to get on digital. And you have to be very careful with certain things. Very bright skies that burn out um, look different on, on digital. And fire um, is really tricky. If you have a lot of fire in your movie, it can look really phony on digital. So where are you at in terms of how you make the decision on a project-by-project -project basis, whether to shoot on film or digital? You know, the last couple of movies I've done, we've had so, so little money. They've been, you know, the last movie I did was four weeks and... 64 locations in four weeks and you know a million dollars basically and so we had to shoot digital uh, and it was great and and the movie looked really good Kat Westergaard shot it and she did a great job with it um, I, the last film film that I did uh, was Honey Dripper and uh, I worked with Dick Pope who shoots Mike Lee's movies on that and we really just felt that digital at that time, we had a lot of very dark skinned people and a lot of very white cotton and uh, getting them both balanced in the same frame and, you know, the latitude of film just, you know, made a lot more sense for that particular movie. Since then, um, Dick has shot Mr. Turner, which is about the painter Turner, and he shot it in digital. Hmm. Um, and it looks cool. So Yeah. VD Mello, maybe with the toughest question of the early evening here, what's your favorite film ever? You know, I think my favorite film watching film is Yojimbo, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Um, it's such a, a great kind of uh, mix of action, genre, and character work um, and music. You know, um, it's just, it's one of those movies that's, that's almost like a fable in a way, um, but it works on a human level as well. So, so you don't feel like you're watching allegories. Um, you know, some of the acting is a little bit over the top on purpose for the bad guys. Um, but, you know, there's a reason that it's been remade as a, as a Western and, and various other things. Um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of movies um, that I was influenced by. Uh, a couple of Mario Monticelli's movies, The Organizer and uh, The Grande Guerra um, are two of my favorite, you know, Italian movies. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it really depends on what you're in the mood for. Yeah. <laughs> and I still see every once in a while a movie that, that you know, is like, wow, that's a keeper. I, you know, in 10 years, I'll want to see that again. Do you remember one by chance off the top of your head, something you saw recently that you thought really, it really did stand out to you? Um, no, <laughs> so good. but you know, I, I continue to go to the movies and, and, and see stuff. Um, and you know, one of the problems when you get older is, you know, you've seen thousands, I've seen thousands of movies. And so something might be good, but you may have seen something very close to it six times before. Yeah. Um, and so it, it really has to be very new in some way or really, really, really well done. Um, you know, I, uh, um, I remember seeing, uh, what did I like last year? I really liked Kerry Fukunaga's, um, uh, Beast of No Nation, which is a really hard movie to watch. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's a, a movie worth watching, but it's, it's no fun, you know, in, in that way that it's just so real. Um, and, um, 
you know, but it's not a movie anybody else made, you know, so it stood out in that way. Yeah. AJ Burke with a fun hypothetical here. If you could resurrect any actor, male or female, no longer living, who you've always wanted to work with, who would it be? Hmm. This is going to be a funny one. Brandon Lee. Really? Yeah. I mean, I think he was, he was going to be a really interesting actor. And even if, if I didn't have anything I wanted to work with him, I, I, I really would have been interested to see what he would have done. And, you know, he was just getting started in, in genre things, but um, there, was, there was kind of some depth there. You know, I, th I think of people like Steve McQueen, who started out doing the, you know, uh, Have Gun, Will Travel, or whatever, not Have Gun, Will Travel, uh, um, the bounty hunter thing that he did, and just westerns, and then moved on to other things. Um, you know, he, he was a very good physical actor, and I was just kind of getting, okay, geez, I'd, I'd like to see what he does next. Got a, just a few more minutes here, and this is a good one from Uncle J73. First, thanks you for your amazing body of work, longtime fan and admirer. Piranha, Alligator, and Howling are three very well-written and memorable, not to mention fun, horror films. I always wondered why you never directed a horror film of your own. Is that something you might be interested in doing down the road? Yeah, I don't know. I, I always felt like um, there are plenty of people doing horror movies. Um, certainly the closest I came to to that genre was Brother from Another Planet, which is kind of a real uh, magical, realist science fiction film, uh, not quite a horror movie. Um, I've written horror movies for other people, and uh, it's a genre that when it's you know well done, I like. But I just never felt like there was a crying need for me particularly um, to jump in and, and direct a horror movie. Another fun hypothetical. All those three were a lot of fun. Um, yeah. They're, you know, the, it, in a way, uh, Piranha is a monster movie. It's not quite a horror movie. Um, and uh, The Howling really is a, you know, kind of a, a postmodern horror movie. And, and by that I mean, I think it was one of the movies where the people in the movie you could tell that they'd seen a horror movie. So there was a, there was a kind of consciousness of, you know, actually six of my friends have been ax murdered in that house. I don't think I'm going to go in looking for my cat. Yeah. Another great hypothetical here. Remy Fincher says, we live in a second golden age of TV and many directors, including Martin Scorsese and David Fincher have forayed into making and producing pilots and series. Would you consider that, especially with platforms like Netflix and Hulu? You know, I've done a little bit, of, and, um, you know, I'd like to do more. I wrote a, a pilot for a series called Dr. Dell, um, and that stars John Hawks. And uh, um, uh, Katie Jacobs, who was one of the creators of House, directed the pilot and would be the, you know, kind of ongoing producer on it. And they, they made a great pilot out of it, and it's still being considered whether it's going to get on TV or not. Um, there's some talk about uh, making Brother from Another Planet into a TV series. Uh, many years ago, I wrote uh, the pilot and a couple episodes um, for a series called Shannon's Deal. And Shannon's Deal, what got on the air, there were about 13 episodes that got on the air over two years, uh, were very, very good. And today, you know, that would have lasted three or four or five, six years. Um, you know, back when I wrote it, there were only three networks and you needed to get something like a 25 share, you know, to stay on TV. Um, you know, certainly Shannon's deal, uh, could get the kind of, you know, four share or six share that is like a big, you know, cable hit, um, these days. So yeah, it's, it's a, one of the things is also, I think it's very interesting that we can now do a limited series you know, a 13 episode series that, you know, maybe comes to its end. There are stories that just don't lend themselves to going on and on and on and on and on. You know, there were other things that is great where, you know, you discover new side characters who get more important as you go. I've certainly written novels, you know, my last novel, uh, uh, A Moment in the Sun, that could be 50 episodes easily, um, you know, if somebody wanted to spend the money to make it. Um, so, no, I, I think it's an exciting thing. And not all TV is great right now, but there's a lot of good work being done there. 
I started by mentioning Lone Star, one of my favorites among many favorite uh, films that you've made. And Blue Vinyl has a question that I've always wanted to ask you about your blend of flashbacks with the present day in Lone Star and what your inspiration was for that stylistic approach. Yeah, I think it was, it was very specifically, I wanted the audience to feel like all this stuff that happened in the past isn't gone. It's still, it's still in the game. It's still in the, the way people deal with each other in this border town. Uh, they like to think that there is a line between them, um, but they're, you know, that line has been crossed so many times that who they are is, is a mix of those cultures, you know, a mix of that history. And so I very specifically wanted there not to be a cut. You know, a cut in a movie says, this is one thing, that's another thing, um, between the past and the present. Um, so that we, we contrive these kind of master shots very often done with a steady cam, not always, um, where you just segued, you know, from one to another. Very much like in, in City of Hope, I have all these kind of master shots where you treat actors, you know, and, and you know, eventually you may come back to the person nine minutes later who you first met. Um, but you've met a whole kind of cross section of the city and what they don't know that the audience now knows is that what this guy is planning is going to affect this guy and this guy is planning something that's going to affect another guy and it's going to come full circle. So you, you try to make the, you know, the physical, you know, uh, cutting of the movie, the rhythm of the movie work for the storytelling, you know, whenever you can. Um, and then sometimes when you have almost no money, you have to do it the other way. You say, well, what can I do well? Um, and so therefore I, I should write something that I can do for $60,000 or a hundred thousand dollars. Just a couple more for you. This one I picked totally selfishly here as you'll understand when you hear the question, a fan wants to know what has been your favorite review or interpretation of one of your films. Do you engage much with the criticism of your work, positive or negative? You know, I, I stopped reading reviews when I was still just a novelist, um, which is a long, long time ago, you know, in, in the, the late 70s. Um, I, would, I was reading reviews where it was so clear that the review was about the reviewer and not the piece, you know, that there was actually factual information that was different in, in the reviews. You know, one review might say, you know, what I, what I you know, noticed about this, this book was there are very few you know, main female characters. And the next review would say, what I love about this book is how many, you know, fully drawn three-dimensional female characters there are. So it's, it's not something that, um, you know, I, I really pay a whole lot of attention to. Um, there has actually been a couple uh, small theater productions of short stories of mine, uh, which I've always thought was kind of cool. Um, you know, I, I wrote a story called I-80 Nebraska, which is all CB radio guys. And a friend of mine, I, I couldn't fly out and see it, saw the theater production of it. And um, they just darkened the theater. And then guys wearing boxes with headlights on them ran up and down the aisles doing, with microphones doing the CB radio talk. It sounds like a great adaptation of a story. So I, it, it's not so much... Um, uh, reviews that I'm interested in. It's how people use those things. You know, one of the nice things that's happened is that actors that I've used early on in their careers have gotten some exposure, you know, in our movies and then gone on to, you know, bigger and better things. Well, we've spent our time here looking back. Let's look forward a little bit. We talked about Django Lives. What other projects can you tell us about that you're working on and to save demand specifically? Yeah, to save the man is um, is set around the turn of the century. It's it's uh, set in 1890 um, at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, um, which was the template for all of the native boarding schools. And uh, it's it's kind of a a boarding school movie. You know, if you think of something like. Um, you know, the Dead Poet Society, except um, the kids in this case are both boys and girls, and they've been sent from all over the country from various tribes, tribes that have been dealing with white people for hundreds of years where everybody speaks English, and tribes that only 10 years ago were literally on the war path at war with the United States government, and they've been sent there very specifically 
um, to become white, to learn how to be white. Um, the guy who started the school, um, his favorite phrase was, to save the man, we must kill the Indian. So there's that, that strange thing that uh, the Carlisle School was kind of the, the Harvard and the Alcatraz of Native Americans. You know, the Pan-Indian movement really started there. A bunch of people who got educated there got law degrees and were among the people who got uh, Native Americans citizenship finally in, in about 1924. So there was this positive side. And then there was this very, very conscious, conscious um, uh, cultural genocide that was going on, that one of the points of the school was to have people forget their culture, in fact, despise their own culture, and, and if possible, not go back to the reservation and their, their, their you know, culture and their people. It sounds fascinating. I wish we could go on a lot longer, but I definitely want to say thank you to everybody who submitted the questions, everybody who has been watching the Q&A, Say thank you to all of films, and most of all, of course, I want to say thank you to you, John Sales. This was fun. This was enlightening. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.